Can I use this as opposed to the caller mic? Is it okay? Yes. Okay. First of all, I'd like to thank Manthan for giving me an opportunity to meet the enlightened citizens of Nagpur. And uh, I hope to learn quite a few things from this interaction, especially from the questions. And that effectively means that I would expect you to pay attention to me for the next one hour. So, and uh, on a Sunday evening for uh, such a turnout, uh, I'm grateful for, to the organizers as well as the people who have taken time out of their weekends to actually be a part of this session. And uh, that inspires people like me to continue doing what we do and also uh, tells us that we are not talking into ether or to the wall and there is an audience that is paying attention to what is being said and what is being done. So thanks a lot. Uh, on this specific topic, you know, there is one change which is uh, I wanted the word Indic as opposed to Indian because it has a slightly different connotation and that is uh, how I would prefer. So the topic according to me is challenges to Indic identity and the way forward. But of course, if Indic identity is synonymous with Indian identity, then there's not a problem. We don't know. Uh, now, on this specific topic, I have already spoken on two different occasions. You know, there is one talk of, uh, on this particular issue that I think came out in 2016 and 17. If possible, please do watch it. Uh, this is not a means of self-edification, but there I've dealt with the issue in a slightly more legal manner. Uh, then I have also dealt with the issue of Rohingya crisis in a talk that I delivered at IIT Madras around I think in 2016 or 2017 on the topic of Indic Renaissance. So one thing that I try and do or I try and avoid is to repeat myself wherever I go and I try and not come across as a, a stuck gramophone. So what is it that I can actually present differently as far as the same topic is concerned uh, to this particular audience? The one thing that I have realized over the last few months or even perhaps let's say the last one year or so is it is impossible to try and address even the most uh, hardcore legal issues without touching upon history or without touching upon societal aspects or without touching upon human considerations so to speak. Because at the end of the day law represents perhaps uh, the culmination of all these thought processes, it ultimately reflects, let's say, perhaps the end point of the journey in some way. Therefore, it becomes very, very important to understand the sandarbh, the context of the talk, before diving into the meat of the topic. So I could perhaps start with an exposition of what is the Citizenship Act, what is the Foreigners Act, what are these international principles in play. What is the meaning of illegal migration? What is the definition of a refugee? How is he different from an asylum seeker? How is an asylum seeker di uh, different from an alien or a foreigner? I can get into each of these issues. But the one thing that has become very, very relevant is the topic of illegal migration forces you to take a position with respect to one central construct, identity. And unless and until you take a concrete position with respect to identity, any argument that is presented to you with respect to the law will fall flat because fundamentally at the heart of it, there is a disagreement on the question of identity. If you're supposed to protect yourself using the law against illegal migration, then the question is what exactly are you protecting yourself against? And what is it that you're worried about? What is it that you're concerned about? And what is it that brings creases to your forehead that you've decided to do something about? That is the fundamental question. What is it that you hold dear about your identity and about being in this country which you believe would be undermined by illegal migration? That is the central question that you have to ask yourself. Now, unfortunately, this is a politically incorrect question. This is an extremely disconcerting question because it requires you to go down a few uncomfortable paths. You have to ask yourself a few very, very uncomfortable questions, which may or may not be secular, which may or may not be politically correct, which may or may not be palatable. So if somebody asks you, okay, if you say that this country cannot open its doors willy-nilly to any illegal migrant, what is the identity of this country? Where does this country draw its identity from? Is it the constitution? 
or does the constitution recognize a pre-existing identity? And therefore, the constitution is not the beginning of modern India's history, but is merely a milestone in India's history. An important milestone at that. That is the fundamental question that I think we should all ask and try and answer. So, if somebody were to believe that India has always been a land of migrants, and therefore there is nothing wrong with a new wave of migration, then it is very, very difficult to argue with that particular person on law because there is a problem and there is a disagreement on the backdrop of the law itself or the context of the argument itself. If somebody says, in fact I read an article recently where Aryans, Mughals and Britishers were lumped in the same basket and each of them was called a, uh, an invading horde or a, a migrant community. Now what does that tell you? It is not possible for me to address the issue of illegal migration without touching upon the serious problems of conditioning that education has created. Because if history has, ex has been distorted and there is absolutely no guts or gumption to talk about history with facts, dehorse any kind of sentiments, keeping aside all your bleeding hearts, your human rights sentiments on the side and just focusing on facts, then it is impossible to have a discussion on the lessons that you're supposed to draw from history and on what is it that you're supposed to prevent and to protect yourself from. It is always possible for somebody to say, here comes a fear mongerer. Here comes a fellow who's full of hatred and he's trying to justify his hatred through some kind of intellectual BS and he is trying to find justifications for it in the constitution which is a secular document. You must be wary and careful of this scoundrel. <laughs> That's always possible. Somebody is capable of making that particular statement. It's okay. I'm, I've, I've, ever since I've decided to talk on topics such as these, I've more or less uh, ignored any kind of trolling that I'm subjected to or any kind of politically incorrect questions that come my way. I'm happy to answer any question as long as you have the guts to take the punches which come from me after that. <laughs> so you use your free speech and I will use my free speech and let us see who wins. So that is how I approach. I have no reason to gag you at all because I think I've done my reading. Let's see if you've done your reading and I'll take you on. So the point is this. This is where who belongs to this land, who, who who does this land belong to? These are the central questions. And these questions you can esotericize and you can philosophize, but these are very mundane, practical, important questions. Okay? So, it is, it's, it's surprising that there is a fundamental bias the moment this topic is framed on these lines. Because a certain point of view has become more or less acceptable even to well-meaning educated Indians. And any other point of view comes across as a hate-filled point of view. Pardon me for saying this, if it offends you, so be it, but it's a position that I have to necessarily make. I would find it easier to convince a bunch of uneducated and certainly not English educated Indians on illegal immigration than having to convince educated Indians on the problems coming with illegal immigration. That is a fact. Because the educated Indian has effectively bought into certain ideas and those ideas have guilt tripped him into accepting certain positions because if he doesn't accept those positions, he's immediately branded a bigot, a fascist, a fundamentalist and for all practical purposes, what is the word I'm looking for? A Sanghi. Okay. So, uh, considering that, it tells you that education has played a significant role in conditioning your mind to opening your doors to your own destruction. I dare use the word destruction. I have no qualms in using the word destruction. So, let me, let me try and uh, make this slightly more uncomfortable. Is India a Hindu country? And if you say India is a Hindu country, when you use the word Hindu, are you using this in a religious sense or a geographical sense, in an ethno-geographic sense or an ethno-religious sense or a civilizational sense? What is the sense in which the word Hindu is being used? Uh, that's a good point. 
we are forbidden from using that particular word. But somebody said that it's in all senses. Who made that statement? Great, okay. Uh, I would largely agree with you. For a different reason, because that word has acquired different meanings in different contexts, but to a very large extent, it still retains an ethno-civilizational context more than a religious context. Because until the colonials decided to craft and carve the word Hindu, we never used it to describe ourselves. The word Hindu practically did not exist, except in colonial records. The word Sanatan Dharam may have existed, or you may have different names for different Sampradayas, but the word Hindu is something that we never used ourselves. Right? Now, in which case, if this is used in an let's say in a civilizational sense, what is the character of India? Is it a nation state or is it a civilization state? Is it a religion based state or is it a language based state? This is one question that I think we have to ask ourselves. What does it effectively mean? A nation state acquires its identity on the basis of imputation of a racial identity or a linguistic identity or perhaps even a religious identity. But for a country like India, which has at the very least, I don't believe, believe that our journey is only 5,000 years. I believe that we have spent at least 7,000 years, at the very least 7,000 years. Now, if that is the journey of this particular civilization, of this particular land, the concept of a nation state does not do justice to our history. Because no one religion or no concept of Abrahamic religion or no concept of a single language does justice to our history. For a moment, let us assume, let us just assume for a moment that there is one mother language which is effectively the fount of all Indian languages. Let us assume that is the case. While that may or may not be the case and I am not an expert on that particular subject, let us assume that is the case for a moment. The fact remains that every language in India has at least a recorded history of 500 to 1000 years, at the very least which means it has had a sufficient period of time to find its own individual expression, to evolve its own history, to evolve its own literature, to evolve its own idiom, to evolve its own syntax and grammar. Therefore, there is, let's say, a mothership, and that mothership has spawned X number of ships, but each of these ships has now acquired an identity of its own, but it still has a cultural connect to the mothership in some way or the other. That effectively captures this, this concept of unity in diversity. Right? But the one thing that you can confidently state is that each of these thoughts and each of these expressions, no matter how individualistic they may be, are a product of this, this, this uh, land and this soil. It has come from here. But then what is here? Are we talking about the India that has come into existence after 1947? No. The expanse of the idea of India goes beyond the geographical borders of India, of 1947. If you can still find fire temples in Baku in Azerbaijan, then there is something that we don't understand yet about the expanse of the civilization. If you're still unearthing certain idols and, uh, let's say, other artifacts in the Middle East, then there is something that we have still not understood of the expanse of this particular civilization. If there was a time when the emperors of Turkey was given, were given the title Dasharatha, then that's, uh, there is something that we have still not understood about the expanse of this particular civilization. The emperors of Turkey were given that particular title, then there is something that we have seriously misunderstood about the history of this particular land. Therefore, what does it mean? Now that uh, civilizational India has shrunk to political India, after multiple ravages of time and history, what exactly are you protecting then? I believe that you're fundamentally protecting one concept, and that concept is the concept of dharma. And that concept is not a religious concept. The construct of dharma is not based on religion at all, according to us, and certainly not in the Latin sense in which religion is understood. Religion comes from religio, which effectively translates to faith. We are not a faith-based system, we are a knowledge-based system. This is a society of seekers. 
What does it effectively translate to? It means that notwithstanding the serious diversity of thought from the north to the south to the east to the west, the one thing that is extremely common is that you choose not to impose one way of life on another way of life and you allow that particular way of life to survive on its own. That is the concept of a sampradaya. Which means every sampradaya has a right to exist. And whoever chooses to subscribe to which sampradaya is entirely dependent on what he believes is his ideal way of achieving, let's call it liberation and not salvation. That is how we have designed our entire society. If this is the civilizational premise of this land, and this is what distinguishes us from everybody else, because I believe that every community and every religion or every country has something to offer to the pool of global thought, and this is India's contribution to the pool of global thought. Any thought process which chooses to impose itself on the land at the expense of every other culture is necessarily antithetical to the spirit of this country. That is the civilizational process. Whether it masquerades as a religion or as an ideology doesn't make a difference because I go by the effect and the consequence of what it does to the native thought of this country, to the native pulse of this country, to the native spirit of this country. That is the test. Therefore, your identity has always been live and let live, please don't impose. Therefore, Anyone who approaches this country with an idea of conquest, either from the standpoint of religion or from the standpoint of ideology, is necessarily going against the spirit of this land and therefore needs to be stopped in his tracks before he entrenches himself in this country. That is the fundamental position. Therefore, when the constitution through Article 1 says India, which is Bharat, it is effectively tying constitutional India to its civilizational roots and says that India is the successor state of that particular civilization, therefore it becomes the civilization state and not just a nation state. What is the difference between a civilization and culture? Sanskriti or Sabhyata mein kuch to antar hona chahiye na? What is the difference between Sabhyata and Sanskriti? Civilization effectively means that your journey has been so far and so wide and so deep that you have multiple sub-identities which are part of this particular huge canvas. That is the only way you can make sense of India. Trying to force fit European style nationalism on India will not work. Trying to apply a Judeo-Abrahamic concept to India's native spirit will not work because the pulse of this land is different. Each of these subcultures has a space, this is like a symphony or let's, say this, let's call it an orchestra where everyone has a role to play and everyone is equally important without which the orchestra will fail, it cannot function. That is the concept of a civilization state. What does this mean in practical terms? If India sees itself as the successor civilization state of the Indian civilization of the Bharatiya civilization, it has a duty to protect that particular space because after thousands of years, you fortunately have one political unit which is capable of responding to domestic threats and external threats as one unit. As opposed to Janapadas running to each other's help whenever there is an external aggression. My fundamental cogitation is to invite people to appreciate the windfall gain in having one political unit called Bharat, as opposed to having Janapadas. Had you survived as Janapadas, I dare say you would not have survived, you would have been balkanized completely. And you would have been swallowed by people around. Therefore your existence is contingent on being part of this political entity called Bharat. And in order for you to protect the identity of Bharat and its civilizational identity, you have to take a position with respect to who can be part of this country and who cannot. And that is not an unconstitutional decision, that is not an unconstitutional cogitation, that is not an unconstitutional thought. If the constitution wanted to dissociate India's future and its present from its past, it should not have used the word Bharat. 
But by using the word Bharat, it has to be given a certain meaning at the end of the day. It is a socio-legal document, which means it is a legal document that recognizes social realities and gives effect to social realities. There are so many lawyers here. Fundamental principle of interpretation when it comes to a legal instrument is no word used in any legislation is redundant or superfluous. It must be given some meaning. Because if it is not given any meaning, that means you admit that the legislature has made a mistake. And the assumption is that in using these words, there was a specific intent that the legislature had in mind when it used the word Bharat to make it synonymous with India. And if you go through the debates, the entire debate in the constitution is to a significant extent. What should be India's identity in light of the fact that it has now become home to multiple thought processes and faith processes. So we said, we will give ourselves a civilizational identity and the promise of this particular civilization has always been equality regardless of religion, dharma nirpeksh. Whether it is sarva dharma sambhav, I'm not necessarily sure of it. Because to say that all religions are necessarily true may not be right from a philosophical or an argumentative standpoint because the quality of thought of each religion is different. To respect two different people is different from respecting their thoughts equally. I don't need to necessarily equate the good with the bad and let's say the gold with the rubbish. But I will certainly take the position as a conscious country that regardless of what you believe in, I will protect your right to believe in that. However, if fundamentally your compass is oriented in such a way that it has aggression as part of its constitutional matrix, as part of its mental matrix, then as a country I have to protect what is mine and what belongs to this country and what has originated from this country. This is something that you need to understand and internalize before you even think of illegal immigration, before you even discuss the concept of illegal immigration. If there is a set of people who believe that you can always build a hospital at a contentious place of worship, those set of people will never find anything wrong with anybody entering the country. That in sum and substance is the problem that you don't seem to understand where you're supposed to be Udarvadi and where you're supposed to hold your positions. To my mind, that is not secularism, that is rank stupidity and ignorance, and which comes at the expense of somebody else's rights and somebody else's faith and future as well. You do not have the right to sacrifice the right of the future. You do not have the right to sign away the rights of the progeny of this country. Therefore, if you decide to cede space to a certain thought process which is hell-bent on imposing itself, then you're not doing it only for your lifetime, you're also doing it for the future. And that dharmic way of life does not give you the right to do so. What, is, what does not belong to you, you cannot sign away. The future does not belong to you. That is something that you need to understand. So when you talk of illegal immigration, why is this topic important? One, fundamentally it alters the demographic composition of this country in an extremely artificial fashion. Assume that there are communities A, B and C which are living in this country. A decides to procreate and produce at a certain pace, B decides to procreate and produce at a certain pace and C decides to procreate and produce at a certain pace. Unless and until you bring in a population control bill, there is nothing that you can do. There's nothing that you can do to ask someone to produce less and procreate less. Okay, how do you monitor that? I don't know, but still. The point is, when you already have this particular issue, do you want to add to this particular mix by inviting trouble from outside? By inviting an artificial population which contributes to existing problems? And that is a question that you have to ask yourself. What, according to you, is the population of illegal migrants in this country at this point of time? Give me a, just spitball, give me a rough figure, give me a ballpark estimate. The government has said about two to two and a half crores, right? Who among you believes that government figures are true figures? Okay. 
do you believe that the government would have actually underplayed it or overplayed it? Underplayed, underplayed it. At least by 50%? Let me push it. At least by 100%? Yes. Possible? Yes. Right. And there's a decent chance that given that we have such an efficient machinery at place when it comes to government dispensations, we are world class, there's a decent chance that a lot of figures would have gone under the radar completely? Yes. They'd have been completely unreported? Yes. Correct. Have you ever heard of an immigration task force in this country? Do you think it exists? No. no. So who takes up the responsibility of detecting illegal migrants? The beat constable with the lati in his hand, right? Look at him, he has to look at gang rape, he has to look at murder, he has to look at thievery, he has to look at everything, including the sophisticated issue of illegal migration. I pity anyone who is a police officer in this country, genuinely speaking. We may abuse them, but it's not a hard task. They must have done something so horribly wrong in their previous lives <laughs> that it is a perpetual sade sati for them when they become a policeman in this life. <laughs> okay. Now going by that logic, if the figure of two and a half crores is not something that is credible or reliable, would I be wrong in saying that the figure could be close to five crores? Okay. Can India do without five crore population? Wouldn't it be better off? Okay. What if that population has chosen to become a captive audience in the hands of vested political and religious interests? Would it not create further trouble? Okay. What is the size of Indian army? 1.3, 1.4 million. Pit that against six crores. Who is going to protect you? Let's take only 50% of that six crores is creating trouble. So that brings it to what? Three crores? Three crores versus 1.3 million. Where do you stand? Let's assume that out of this, no, no, it's actually only one crore. 1.3 million versus one crore. Where do you stand? Do you have enough police constables and policemen to protect you in your states and cities? Are they so efficient that they arrive at the spot with lightning speed, even to the extent that Bollywood portrays, the moment it's over, the sirens start uh, blaring? That doesn't happen, right? So who is going to protect you if tomorrow there is an armed mob that stands outside your gated community with your private security guards and says, send them out or we'll finish you? What do you do then? Now the, sorry, pray to God. This country is running only on Ram Bharose, but even Jai Shri Ram is politically incorrected today. So I don't know what to say. I'll just leave it at that. The moment you say Jai Shri Ram when there's a mob outside you, they will say you threatened the mob. <laughs> you don't even have the luxury. You don't even have the luxury of invoking your God's name in the time of misery and trouble. You see, how free speech works, very convenient in this country. So the point I'm trying to make is, if these are the figures, and this is the reality, you are looking at this particular reality from the air-conditioned, perfumed atmosphere of the middle class and the upper middle class at the very best. What about the people who are living in slums? Who is going to protect them? Do you think the law literally exists to protect them? No, they don't. Who is going to protect them when somebody decides to offer his services at less than 30% on a daily wage basis than the Indian? How many of you can confidently say that our Indian businessmen are so conscious and so nationalistic that they are willing to forego profits for country? Go ahead, make the statement. Let me see how many of you are confident of making that statement. If somebody decides to offer his services on a daily wage basis at 30% of the price at which the Indian laborer offers, Will it not happen that these people are bound to take away jobs? Which is why I said it's easier to convince the uneducated person and the daily wage laborer of the issue of illegal immigration than anybody else because they are bearing the brunt of it on a daily basis. Loss of lives, loss of jobs, loss of dignity, loss of honor, and to top it all, if they go to the police, they'll be branded unsecular, fundamentalist, fascist, and they can't even understand those damn words. They're like, what on earth is going on? I came here because I have a legitimate issue. My cattle is being stolen. My cattle is even being raped. They, the, you, did you see the news reports? A calf being raped, right? This is the extent to which we have to deal with this kind of nonsense. The point is, every consideration which does not have a sophisticated, politically correct voice, uh, let's say ventilating its point of view, will not find representation in this country. So either you need an articulate voice or you need to throw stones. That is how we have effectively decided to uh, portray the Indian state. It responds only to politically correct pressure 
or it responds to mob violence. It does not listen to the law-abiding, politically incorrect voice. Because that's too much of a trouble. Its existence is a problem. Regardless of whoever is in power, that doesn't make a difference. That much I think I've realized by now. So if this is the position, why is illegal immigration not a burning issue? I come from Noida. Greater Noida saw an attack of 15 to 20 people in a proper gated community with crowbars and pickaxes only because uh, a maid of Bangladeshi origin was asked to leave and quit her work. And they decided to retaliate with this. With all the gated community uh, security that they had at their disposal, they could do jack. Nothing was achieved. They destroyed the place and left. Why is asking this question fundamentally politically incorrect? When they say India must provide space to all these people, India must open its doors to all these people, who is going to open their doors? At whose expense is the resources or, or are the resources being allotted? That's a fundamental question that you have to ask. Now there's a decent chance somebody might say, okay, if your position is based entirely on resources, are you okay with even Indic communities or let's say Hindu illegal migrants being sent back? That will be the next question, right? That will be the next question, which is why you have to be sure of your identity. Otherwise, your own argument will be used against you. Because they say, oh, resource is the problem. Inko bhi bhej do. Kya problem hai? Kya hai? Why are you taking two different positions? OK, I'll, I'll take a simple position. Why are our missiles not named after Akbar, Babar, and Humayun? Why are they called Agni, Prithvi? If you take the argument to that extent, why is your battle tank called Arjun? Why are your awards named after Arjuna and Drona? What are, you ex what are you exactly referring to and what is it that you're acknowledging when you do these things? Exactly. It represents the civilizational ethos of this country and the collective memory and the civilizational memory of this country. So when you have at the very least 52 countries which are part of OIC, the Organization of Islamic Countries, which are in a position to take care of people who belong to a particular faith. And very sure tomorrow somebody will demand, name these, these awards as Akbar award or something like that. Why not? They will certainly do it. Road ke naam badalne mein aap ko itni taklif ho rahi hai, kya baat kar rahe sir aap? I mean, it's so difficult to have Aurangzeb lifted off that place and even replace it with Abdul Kalam. <laughs> so the point is, the point I'm trying to make is this. Which is why the, the more you pussyfoot around the question of identity, the more it is going to become difficult for you to take the position that India is primarily the homeland for those people who believe in India's civilizational identity, which is the Indic identity. That does not take away my promise of equality to citizens. But for you to say that I must treat every illegal migrant and every refugee at par with each other or at par with citizens, I'm sorry, I cannot accept that particular position. Today, it has come to a point that perhaps Rohingya immigrants enjoy better sanitary conditions than Pakistani Hindu refugees and perhaps even Kashmiri Hindus. That is a fact. Last summer, Pakistani Hindu refugees who were living in Delhi lived without electricity for a good three weeks in inhuman, unsanitary conditions. But nobody seems to know of it at all. Private initiatives ultimately helped them and provided them with some kind of succor, but beyond that, I did not see any state party, any state establishment, any government, any political party, or the cultural organization taking initiative to go and help them. Hinduism was born in America, correct? Wrong, no? So the stupidity of that particular assertion is clear. Hinduism is native to India, wrong? Oh, no, no, you can't say that. Please don't agree. You'll find it difficult to survive in your offices and colleges and other places. Don't say it at all. Remain silent. That's perhaps the best way to answer to that question. No? If India does not open its doors, to communities which share the civilizational identity of this land, where are they supposed to find shelter? 
in the Islamic Republic of Saudi Arabia, it's, I'm sorry, you can't use the word republic when it comes to Saudi Arabia, no, I forgot, right. <laughs> so my point is, where are they supposed to find shelter? The history of this particular issue, now I'll come to the issue. So when Bengal was partitioned, when, can somebody tell me when? 1905? Lord Curzon, Lord Curzon, he did it, right? Right, okay. So when he decided to partition Bengal, he decided to do that to create or to sow the seeds for a Muslim dominated province. And which is why they decided to give East Bengal to these people. Surprisingly, the Dhakeshwari temple after which Dhaka is named is in East Bengal. Anyways, the point is, that is when, in fact, uh, if somebody were to perhaps pay a bit more attention to the seeds of the movement for partition, they did not start in Pakistan, they started elsewhere. The leading intellectuals came from Bengal for partition. The seeds for partition were, were actually sown in that particular state, which was opposed tooth and nail by Indian nationalists. Oh, but Indian nationalism is toxic masculinity. You can't even mention that. I'm sorry, I forgot. So the point is, Indian whatever, they, let's call them X, they did this. Okay. So when they decided to, uh, to do that, effectively, there were uh, elements even at that point of time who said, you're being communal. I'm sorry, this is not the way to communalize this particular issue. It's just a political decision. It has got nothing to do with religion. Anything that has to do with one particular religion has got nothing to do with religion. As simple as that. <laughs> Remove it from the equation altogether, turn a blind eye and focus like a mountain goat with its head down and without looking at the summit. Keep walking. Okay, that's what you should do. So anyways, this is what happened. When they decided to do this, that invading horde of land-hungry, let's call it barbarians, spilled over into Assam, the then Assam, greater Assam. And this is recorded in the report of C.S. Mullen in 1931, captured in the judgment of the Supreme Court. And captured in the report of, I think, uh, Lieutenant General S.K. Sina when he was the governor of Assam. Captured perhaps also in the 175th Law Commission report, which extensively details the history of this particular issue. I'm giving you constitutional, politically correct documents, just in case you don't think I'm using WhatsApp University. Okay. So anyways, so this, they spill over into that particular place. And what are the areas that they choose to occupy? Rich, fertile Brahmaputra Valley. Rich, fertile forest areas, hills. It reminds me of what is happening today. Coastline, hills, forests, these seem to be the primary areas for illegal migrants. Some, it's almost as if like Chumbaks attracted to Ion, they're they are going towards resource rich areas. I, I'm sure it must be a coincidence, I could be wrong. There's a jaundiced saffron eyes that I always wear, you see, so it's, it's very difficult, so what do I do? There must be something fundamentally wrong with the DNA. Anyways, the point is, so these people, they enter the place, and the Britisher says, he is the one crying, that the indigenous Assamese identity is being eroded on a massive basis as a consequence of this demographic invasion. He calls it demographic invasion. The word invasion is used. I'm sorry, I didn't use it, he used it. I'm sure he, knows un he understands English better than me. So this is what happened that continues. So that is one wave. So there is already a demographic alteration that has happened before partition. Coupled with that, there are two milestones that you must remember. In and around the time of partition, that is the 1947 partition, there is another wave that happens. Because the idea is to claim as much land as possible as Muslim dominated so that it becomes part of the holy, pure country of Pakistan. That is effectively the game at play. There's a book written by a former IPS officer who served in those areas. It's called Lebensraum. Effectively, that is the word that was used uh, in the Nazi regime. Lebensraum means the free living space. 
Nazis decided that we are the master race and Germany is too small a country for us to live and digest. So let's do something, the whole world belongs to us. So let's find free living space for the entire master Aryan race because we need resources. So let's find those places where, are, where there are enough resources. So let's go to the Rhine Valley in France, let's go to Czechoslovakia, then let's go to Poland, let's go to each of these places. So that is the same strategy that is being employed here, that go and settle in those places where you find extensive resources and decide to grow in, ma in, in massive numbers so that it becomes difficult for anybody to even think of deportation. That is effectively where we are today. So this happens. Then they decide that, okay, we have to somehow expel these illegal migrants. So we come out with a 1950 legislation called the uh, illegal migrants, expulsion of migrants uh, uh, from illegal migrants from Assam of 1950. That legislation comes about. But the good part about Indian laws is that they're very static. They stay. They, they do not believe in enforcement at all. Implementation is something that we don't believe in at all. We basically say we are thinkers. We are not doers. Why should we act on what we have decided to think? So let's leave it at that. <laughs> Let's leave it at that. Let us see how beautifully it stays at one place. So it stayed. Then history decides to act. How does history decide to act? So, okay, perhaps religion did not have a role to play, but over 3 lakh people or over 3 million people were killed in East Pakistan. People who were killed were Hindus, but I don't know who killed them. Okay, I, I really don't know who killed them, but they were killed. I'm sure they were killed because they were Hindus, but I'm sure the, the motivation was not religion. I'm very, very sure of that. Okay, I'm absolutely sure of that. It was only political calculation at play and nothing else. Only politics. Human beings are all about politics. Religion, no, 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 only for others, okay? So anyways, without any religious motivation, people of a certain religious community were killed. What happens then? 10 million people pour into India. And India says, Either you handle your problems or I'll be forced to step in because I'm your neighboring country and people are pouring into my country. So then, Miss, is she Miss or Mrs? I still haven't been able to decide. Okay, but maybe then Mrs. and now Miss because politically correct usage would be Miss now, even for someone who existed before. Otherwise, I'm sorry, you're going against feminism. So it's Miss Gandhi, okay? <laughs> so what Miss Gandhi does is that she says, you get your act together or I'm getting into the place. So she decides to act. And from 1961 onwards, in fact, that particular issue has been festing. They keep pouring and pouring and pouring and pouring because atrocities are happening on a daily basis without any religious motivation, but still we keep coming here. Okay. Then we act. Then what happens is uh, Mujibur Rahman and Indra Gandhi enter into an agreement, a 1974 accord. Before that, uh, the fount of all that is great in this country, Nehru entered into a pact with Liyakat Ali in 1950. Basically saying that I will protect your religious minorities and you will protect my religious minorities. We somehow seem to have done a very good job of it. But they have not done a great job of it, but I'm sure religion did not play a role there. Okay. <laughs> so this happened. So until uh, 1971, the population of non-Muslims in the land of the pure was 23%. And it came down to 3% because 20% of the Hindu population lived in East Pakistan. So that entered the account of today's Bangladesh, erstwhile East Pakistan. What happens then? Systematically, that number dwindles, partly because these guys are rushing here because of persecution, increasing radicalization. I'm, I'm not sure, okay, some form of radicalization happens in Bangladesh. And therefore these people say, no, no, we can't survive in this country. Our temples are being killed for, I mean, are destroyed for political purposes. Our women are being raped for political purposes, which has got nothing to do with religion. Let's go to the country where we hope there will be some kind of uh, asylum that is given to us. So we decide to come to India. Now they come to India. Now the thing about India is Indian state doesn't care about its own citizens. What will it care for these people? <laughs> Such an apathetic country, we don't care for our own people living in inhuman conditions. Where is the time for refugees? But we do have time for Rohingya refugees, is something that you must remember. Now, so what happens? So these people come, and this accord is entered into, and then we say, okay, 19, 
48 is effectively the timeline that the constitution lays down for vestational grant of citizenship to its people. Saying people who have lived here until I think the 19th of July 1948, these are the people who shall be considered for the purposes of citizenship. And we say there must be some blood connection. It's not just by birth. We decide to grant citizenship on the basis of blood, which is your grandfather should have lived here, somebody should have lived here, that is the basis. Okay? That deadline is changed for Assam. We say, for Assam, we will extend it to 1st of January 1966. If you were an Assamese, wouldn't you wonder, why one rule for the rest of the country and why another rule for me? Why is the deadline being extended to 1st of January 1966 to accommodate external interests? Who may or may not be necessarily sympathetic to my civilizational worldview? I don't know. Then that 1st of January 1966 is again extended to 24th of March, midnight of 24th of March 1971. So there are three timelines. Until 1966 January, between 66 January to 71 March and post 71 March. Why is this important? These timelines are important to decide who qualifies as a citizen or a foreigner or an illegal migrant for the purposes of deportation from India. Okay. So here two important legislations come into being and they, come, they become relevant. One is the Foreigners Act of 1946 and the other is the Citizenship Act of 1955. The Foreigners Act says someone who is not a citizen is a foreigner. I can't find a more, a better example of a tautologous definition, but he can. Citizen is not a foreigner, ho. very simple, okay? So citizen is hai? Ye defined hai? in the Citizenship Act, but it does not define a citizen it defines who is an illegal migrant, which says you've come here without valid documents or you've come with valid documents which have become invalid because they've expired. These are the two categories that you fall under. Okay? Please note that there is no definition of the word refugee in either of these legislations. So if you use the word refugee, you should ask yourself, where are you tracing this from? Because you see, we are all constitutional patriots. We are all legal patriots. We believe in the constitution and the law. So tell me where do you find the word refugee in the constitution or in any law? If not, why are you giving them that status? Automatically, koi bhi sharanarthi ban jata hai kya? Uske koi requirements nahi hote hai kya? Isn't there a basic legal criterion that you're supposed to satisfy in order for you to be given the status of a refugee? That is effectively the question. So in the absence of a refugee law or a definition or a paribhasha for the term refugee, everyone who enters this country without valid documents or who overstays his welcome in this particular country falls under what? Illegal migrant. Now please remember this. So when do you jump from the basket of illegal migrant to the basket of refugee? What is the law on this particular point? So there are international instruments on this. There is a 1951 convention that deals with the aspect of treatment of refugees. And then there is a 1967 protocol. India is not a signatory to either of these two documents. No. Let's say that India for all practical purposes has not adopted these instruments for implementation in India because we follow the dual or municipal adoption policy. Unless and until these instruments have become part of a national legislation, no Indian court has the right or the power or the duty to enforce them. Let me just finish the point. Agreed, fair enough. When it comes to the New York Convention also, the principle of non-refoulement applies, right? And when it speaks of the principle of non-refoulement, all it basically says is, when somebody decides to enter this particular country, you cannot send them back to the place where they, they have suffered from, uh, from persecution unless and until circumstances have changed and that particular country is willing to take them back. That's one. Second, is you're supposed to share the burden of refugees, particularly when that affects all the neighboring countries. Burden sharing of refugee crisis and contributing to the rehabilitation is the fundamental principle behind any refugee law principle. Particularly, in, let's assume for a moment that India has not even signed the New York Convention. Even then it applies for a different reason. Because international law has 
carved out certain basic principles which every country has to abide by, whether or not they're signatories of the 1951 convention when it comes to treatment of refugees. And one principle that is part of these customary principles is the principles of non-refoulement, okay? What does this effectively mean? When we do not have a refugee law in this particular country as part of our national legislations, we have only what is known as a standard operating procedure. And that standard operating procedure says that we will grant the status of a refugee only after our security verification is done. And we believe that the group or the community does not pose a threat to the security of this country, to the integrity of this country, for national security or domestic security. That is something that India has the prerogative to decide. Which is to say, I am happy to let in Afghans inside this country because I don't see a security threat from them. But I certainly see a security threat from Rohingyas, therefore I have a problem. I don't see a security threat from Tibetans, therefore I will allow them inside this country. But I certainly see a security threat from Rohingyas. This is a position that India is entitled to take. All over the world, thankfully, I mean even uh, organizations and especially like Al Jazeera, Reuters are basically saying, why is India not doing anything about it? Why is India not doing anything about it? Why are the 52 OIC countries not doing anything about it? Why do they not contribute to this particular issue? If you have taken an interest in this issue to feverishly whine and crib about it, then why are you not stepping forward with any kind of concrete help? And when you make the allegation that India has done nothing, I'm sorry, India has spent millions of dollars among the first few countries to send relief equipment to help Rohingyas to ensure that they at least have the equipment to live in sanitary conditions was India. India has also chosen to financially support Bangladesh. Okay, but India is a, a saffron sanghi country. Ek minute, isko side mein rakh dete. Okay. Bangladesh is now saying, I can't take these people anymore. They're creating law and order problems. And they've requested Myanmar to take them back. Bangladesh, the truly democratic, plural, and diverse country, as opposed to the fascist country that India is, has effectively told the world, I do not want to house them any further. I do not want to make them permanent citizens of this land. I'm happy to share my resources with them as long as you're not in a position to rehabilitate them, but now kindly take them back. Myanmar has expressed its willingness to take them back. Recently, I read a uh, news report where India has built about 250 paka houses in Myanmar, in the Arakan region, for Rohingyas. This is something that India has done. But surprisingly, I didn't find a report in Al Jazeera about this, but it's okay, they must have missed it. <laughs> the point I'm trying to make is this. This is something that India has done. Most importantly, what is the Indian Supreme Court's position with respect to refugees? The court has said in a judgment of 1991, Louis D. Raitt versus, I think, Union of India, that people who come to India, as long as they are not citizens and who are illegal migrants, have an expectation and can be treated with rights which are consistent with Article 21 but they do not have rights to expect rehabilitation and settlement in this particular country because that is for the government to decide on a case-to-case -case basis. Now, if a government has the power to decide on a case-to-case -case basis, that effectively means there will be a few political considerations. Unless and until it is our assumption that government is apolitical, not possible, no? So the point is, the treatment of refugees in this country has not been consistent because it has varied from government to government depending on their own considerations, apart from security considerations. I don't know which takes the priority, but never both considerations exist. Now, some may have decided to do so because they see a future vote bank. And some may have chosen to do so because they genuinely believe that India must do it because after all, we are the dharamshala of the world. We should do it. Okay. So we have decided to do it. Now, the point is this. In the absence of a concrete legislation which takes a categorical position with respect to considerations such as security considerations and even demographic considerations, you're effectively at the mercy of the intent of the government of the day. If the government of the day had said, I have no problems on security issues with respect to Rohingyas and had decided to bestow upon them the status of refugees, is there anything that you or I could have done as citizens of this country? Very little. The only thing is, the government's power to expel a foreigner is absolute under the law, 
but the government's power to settle anyone in this country is not absolute. These are two different things. It's not necessarily the converse. You have the power to expel anyone who is a foreigner in the interest of protecting sovereignty. But if you choose to house or settle someone at the expense of sovereignty, then I suspect that citizens have a right to approach the court. We approach the court for everything under the sun these days. Why not this? This is even more important, right? Therefore, as far as illegal migration is concerned, kindly do not use the word refugee that freely. Don't be easy and loose with that word. Don't play fast and loose with that word. Anyone who does not have valid documents at the outset is only an illegal migrant unless and until that situation is changed as a consequence of recognition by the government. Now, here's the important aspect. I'll use Assam as a case study to just explain to you what has happened over the years so that you get a clearer picture of what is happening in other parts of the country and why it is necessary for a similar exercise such as the NRC to be carried out in the rest of the country for us to have a clearer picture of how many people are there amidst us. It's important. What is the population that we are looking at? Who are the people who have a vested interest in keeping them here? What is the political, let's call it a religious motivation or any other motivation behind rehabilitating them in such huge numbers? Why are people willing to take the sword out and come out on the streets threatening with violence merely because these people are not being given the status of refugees. What is that motivation? That is important. For which other refugee community, so to speak, have these organizations stepped forward? I don't remember any such thing happening with respect to Kashmiri Hindus in their own land. The amount of protests, the amount of outpouring of grief, the amount of media coverage, and the amount of pressure that is being built on the current dispensation to house and accommodate Rohingyas, I don't think was put on the government with respect to rehabilitation of Kashmiri Hindus in Jammu and Kashmir. <coughs> and that, according to me, sums up effectively the story of 70 years of Indian secularism. That's a topic for another day. But the point is this. The point is... The apathy on the part of successive governments to act on this particular issue is one of the single biggest causes for triggering insurgency in Assam. Because when they realized that small peripheral states, so-called peripheral states don't matter to Delhi and their interests are not being heard and their legitimate concerns are not being considered, they said, I have no other option now. My indigenous identity is under vicious attack and nobody seems to care a damn about it, therefore I have no other option. In 1979, I think that was when Ulfa was established, they chose one spot in Assam as the spot where they were founded. I think it's called Ranggar or some place in Assam. Why did they choose that spot? That is perhaps the spot where uh, their hero, Pukan, uh, the guy who fought against the Mughals. <laughs> Correct. Lakshapur Pukhar. That is the spot where he won his victories. Imagine what kind of memory they had to invoke against the Indian state in order for them to pick up the gun and the weapon against the Indian state. I am not going to condone violence, nor am I going to condone anybody picking up the government against, gun against the Indian state, because for me the Indian state is supreme and sacrosanct. There is no question of it. There is no compromise on it. But if the Indian state chooses not to pay attention to each of these identities and their legitimate concerns, and it is busy pampering vested interests, what are these people expected to do? That's a question that you have to ask. Please understand, this ties into the point that I made before, that notwithstanding the fact that there is a cultural unity, there is a fierce pride in every person of every region in this country with respect to his regional identity. And he wants to protect it. Why she wants to protect it? Why just he? Therefore, you have to be conscious of these identities. You have to be conscious of these legitimate concerns when you decide to open your doors to anyone. So then somebody might say, okay, if you're interested in protecting the Assamese identity, what is your position with respect to the Citizenship Amendment Bill of 2016? Right? You had the question. I think that was coming. Right? I'll answer it now. I saw it. I'm coming. 
The reason is this. My position with respect to the Citizenship Amendment Bill has always been very clear. No one state should bear the burden of rehabilitating or settling migrants of Hindu, Buddhist, Parsi or Jain origins or even Christian because that's there as part of the bill from the neighboring countries into India. Each and every state must step up and share that particular burden. Because everyone is concerned about protecting his regional identity. Because at the end of the day, we may be the Republic of India, but for all practical purposes, we are a United States of India because of our distinct cultural expressions and individual ling linguistic expressions. Therefore, we are interested in protecting it. Whether it comes to imposition of one language from one part of the country to another part of the country or whatever it may be, this is the fundamental impulse. So when it comes to illegal immigration and citizenship amendment bill and refugees, let's take a consistent position. Instead of actually playing footsie with each of these issues, let's see what is the position that I am advocating. If you start with the premise and you agree with the premise that India is a civilizational state with its Indic identity at the heart of its identity, the consequence would be that India is the natural homeland for persecuted Indic communities regardless of where they are persecuted, especially in the immediate neighborhood. That means India must be the place that they must come to to find support, to find shelter, to find asylum when they are persecuted regardless of where they are persecuted. However, when it comes to anybody else, India has a right to apply its right of positive discrimination when it comes to security concerns and demographic concerns. That is the position. If this position is something that somebody finds convenient, then I'm sorry to say you have not learnt your lessons from history. The Constitution is not a book of history. Therefore, the Constitution is not going to sit and teach you every lesson that you're supposed to have learnt from history. It is for you to do so. And the Constitution is not created in vacuum. It does not say turn a blind eye to your past and only look at the future. It equally says learn equally from the mistakes of the past and the lessons from the past and the positive issues and achievements of the past. That is the meaning of the use of the word Bharat. Now, for a better part of this issue, it was relegated to the margins because it was always the problem of the Northeast and Northeast is never part of the mainstream discourse. When we think of the Northeast, we lump it. Beyond that, we have very little idea what happens there. You should actually go to uh, uh, Mizoram, Arunachal Pradesh, and, and even Manipur for that matter, and see how they celebrate Independence Day. They are out on the streets. You have, you have bands playing on the streets. Some of the cleanest places that I have seen in India so far. That is the reality of that particular part of the country. Now that illegal immigration has spilled over from the northeast and other parts of the country, that is when we have started waking up. And I don't think we are even waking up enough. There are news reports, credible news reports, which categorically show <coughs> that there is a well-oiled machinery that is facilitating the entry of illegal migrants in, into this particular country. And they are settling in the most vulnerable of places, in the most, let's say, vulnerable of flashpoints and hotspots. Why should 40,000 people who come from Assam or West Bengal, from Myanmar, go and sit in Jammu and Kashmir? What is the significance of that particular place? What is the significance of that particular site? Why have you chosen to settle in and around the Indian Army's cantonment in Jammu? What is the intention? Are we that naive to not see the intention? Does the constitution force naive it on us? I hope not. What is the intention when these people land in Chembur? What is the intention when these people go to Kadalur and Neveli? What is the intention when they go to Kochi? What is the intention when they go to Hyderabad? What is happening? Shouldn't it alarm us that there exists a, a dark channel which is so well oiled with or without support from state actors that these people find ready entry and access into this country, they have Aadhaar cards, they find jobs immediately, there are enough people who immediately step up to rehabilitate them in this country. Something is going wrong somewhere, terribly, and at the expense of our future.
this is not fear mongering. If someone says this is fear mongering, I'm sorry to say you're being apathetic and stupid. You just don't seem to understand the legitimate concern th that is coming here. If demographic balance or imbalance has shown itself to be detrimental to Indic communities in the past in modern Indian history, are you saying that demographic balance is not a legitimate concern for the future? Don't people have a right to even voice this particular opinion? Unfortunately, peer pressure, political correctness, the forced atmosphere of a skewed version and definition of secularism prevent you from asking these questions. And you will never be exposed to data or statistics on this particular point. In 1999, when the 175th Law Commission report was being published and prepared, the figures then were as follows. They categorically said 1.5 to 1.8 million illegal immigrants are entering the state of West Bengal annually. Sorry, this was 15 to 18 million, that's 1.5 to 1.8 crore annually. In light of these figures in 1999, is it truly your case that only 40 lakh illegal migrants have been found through the NRC exercise in Assam? Why just West Bengal? Do you know that Maharashtra was mentioned as part of the particular report, I think in para 3.2? The figure was close to 5 lakhs or 6 lakhs. Delhi was mentioned. So in 1999, somebody had already raised a red flag with respect to this particular issue. And today we are in 2019. And it is our case apparently that there are only 40 lakh illegal migrants in Assam. Frankly speaking, all other priorities and concerns need to be put aside and you have to put a pin on it and you have to initiate an NRC exercise on a war footing across the country. Foreigners tribunals under the Foreigners Act must be set up across the country and not just in the Northeast. You need to set up a proper immigration task force and you need to fund it properly to ensure that they have the power to detect and expel. You need more judges for this, you need more lawyers for this, you need more constables for this, you need more policemen for this. You need more technology to detect each of these things and you need to ensure that the, the porous border, it's about 400 kilometers and odd, that's the only strip which separates Assam from Bangladesh, which is singularly responsible for that massive an infiltration. This is an infiltration, it's not an immigration. This is an invasion, it's not an immigration. Unfortunately, what is the word that I'm looking for? The esotericization of this topic in human rights terms without paying attention to the other considerations. I am absolutely open to considering the human rights angle of this particular issue, which means that India, which aspires to be at the very least a regional power, must step up and must earmark resources to support these people wherever they exist. And when people come to this country, you treat them with dignity and you ensure that their conditions are sanitary. I am not against that. But the very fact that they have an open access to India and they're able to walk into India as if it's a walk in the park is seriously problematic. The first duty of a state, whether it's a nation state or a civilizational state, is to protect the integrity of its borders. And if you tell me that demographics had, had no role to play whatsoever or has no role to play whatsoever when it comes to national integration or sovereignty, then effectively you turn a blind eye to the two nation theory which led to the partition. Or you're turning a blind eye to a non-political, non-cultural, non-social, non-economic consideration that's playing itself out in Kashmir. If you're telling me, why do you always learn from the worst of examples to decide what your future should be? You test the robustness of a system by its ability to withstand the worst of pressures. That is how you, you test and check for quality control. Not the mean, but the extreme, so that you know what are the boundary conditions under which that system can operate. The Indian state and the Indian machinery is operating at a suboptimal, subpar system where its borders are open for anyone to enter into. And what is even worse is that there are dramatis persona inside this country who are willing to give intellectual justifications to justify illegal migration and to pass it off and masquerade it as refugees. 
This is a discussion that must be carried out and that must be undertaken across the country on a war footing as much as possible. And take it from me in writing that if you were to reach out to people who are actually daily wage laborers and workers, you will find massive data and support coming from them for this particular issue because they are the ones bearing the brunt of it. You don't lose a job because of illegal migration, at least not today. You don't lose land, at least not today. But who is to say what will happen in the future? Look. Which was the American consulate which was attacked in India? In which city was it located? Was it in Mumbai? No. Calcutta? No. Hyderabad. Hyderabad was the place where the American consulate was attacked. So if I were to find that these illegal migrants of a particular affiliation seem to be gravitating towards one particular place, which already has a history when it comes to terrorism-related activities. Is it not something that must ensure that your antenna goes up and says, okay, I need to sit and take a look at what's happening? Forget Hyderabad. Perhaps that's an unorthodox example. Why is Jammu and Kashmir and settlement around Jammu and Kashmir not raising enough eyebrows? 2015, the Tribune reported that a Rohingya militant was found and he was killed as part of an anti-terrorist operation in Kashmir in 2015. This is a credible news report, not from a right-wing fascist Hindutva rag. This is from a mainstream newspaper. What is a Rohingya militant doing in Kashmir fighting the Indian Armed Forces? What is his nexus? What is his incentive? What is his skin in the game? Because the history of Rohingya movement in, in Myanmar is a history of the establishment of an independent, autonomous Islamic Republic. That has been their goal right from the beginning and that has been recorded over and over again. And as far as who are these Rohingyas, colonial records categorically state that these are Muslim laborers who were deported from East Bengal, specifically Chittagong. They were recorded as Chittagongians in colonial records, who were taken there. Somebody is bound to say, you seem to have a problem with one particular religion. I'm so sorry. I never made a statement against any particular faith because I believe that the Indian brand of Islam is a different brand altogether. And that is the brand I subscribe to, assuming that there exists such a brand. And if you disagree with it, then there's a problem with you, not with me. Right? You believe that there exists a brand of Islam called Indian Islam. I agree with you. These are the people who according to you, have not subscribed to the two-nation theory. Fantastic, I agree with you. In which case, I have a problem with someone who subscribed to the two-nation theory. At the end of the day, whether you call it Bangladesh or not, they were the ones who voted for East Pakistan also. <laughs> what else are we talking about? I would strongly urge you to try and apply common sense as opposed to allowing a candle and a bleeding heart to dictate your decisions. You don't need to take a walk to Jantar Mantar in India Gate to decide all of this. Maybe, I don't know what is the hotspot here for these things in Nagpur, that's the hotspot in Delhi. But the point is, for a moment, you, you have to apply only facts, be mercenary about these aspects, because if you allow yourself to get mushy and if you allow yourself to get soft on these aspects, whether you pay the price for it in your lifetime or not, the future is certainly going to pay the price for it. That is a fact. I would seriously urge the citizens and the enlightened citizens of Nagpur to put pressure on your elected representatives to initiate the process of NRC in the state of Maharashtra. And the numbers will shock you and scare you. When the numbers truly come out, then you'll really know what is the real situation and where you have landed yourself. If somebody decides to come to this country for better economic opportunities, let him do so legally. Come here, ask for a job. If Indians have the right to go and work in any other part of the world, others should have the right to come to India and work here. I don't disagree with that. But why illegally? Apply to India, come here. At least make sure that your presence and existence is known to authorities. Why do you keep running away from the authorities and ensure that your existence is under the radar? What is the intention? How is it that those people who always seem to have a particular victimhood complex 
I mean specific organizations, not communities, of course. These organizations are the ones who are stepping up to support illegal immigrants. That means they clearly see a potential resource in them. They potentially see an opportunity in them. They see a manpower in them. They see numbers in them. My only request to you is this. Kindly do not treat this topic as another dry, boring, esoteric topic. This is as real as it gets. This is as practical and as mundane as it gets because it affects your immediate future. Not the far future, the immediate future. In the next few years, you'll start seeing the consequences of this. Questions, please. जो प्रेजेंट गवर्नमेंट है उसका पोटेंशियल आपको प्रीवियस गवर्नमेंट से बेटर लगता है कि वो कुछ कर पाएंगे इसमें कि उनके भी हाथ के बात नहीं है 2014 के मैनिफेस्टो में उन्होंने कहा था दैट दे विल डिपोर्ट एंड एक्सपेल एवरी इलीगल माइग्रेंट एंड दे आल्सो मेड द स्टेटमेंट दैट परसिक्यूटेड इंडिक कम्युनिटीज फ्रॉम अक्रॉस द वर्ल्ड विल फाइंड शेल्टर इन दिस कंट्री this is not the first year of this government, this is the sixth year of this government. Okay? Pichle paanch saal mein aapka analysis kya hai? What do you think? Do you think they've done enough? Okay, then you've answered the question. I didn't have to answer the question at all. Okay, let's put this, uh, let's, let's just do a poll here. How many people believe that the government has done enough on the aspect of illegal migration? And what would that be, sir? Just explain what is 0 to 1 in this case. Okay, so what have they done? Saying is not doing, so what have they done? In which year? 2019. What did they do in 2014? When did the Citizenship Amendment Bill come about? 2016. What were they doing from 14 to 16? Thinking. No, no. Okay, so here's where I, I, I don't disagree with you, but allow me to disagree with you on something else. The tragedy of Indian politics is the tragedy of poor expectations and low expectations. Because the one before, no, 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 I'm not blaming you, sir. All I'm saying is the issue is so critical that somebody comes from negative to zero, it becomes positive. Okay, I certainly believe that this government is saying all the right things. I do not hold brief for the government nor am I anti-government. I am simply saying, if you believe that you have done enough in the time that you already have had, then perhaps there is a serious problem in our definitions as to what, is, what qualifies as doing. I would only request you to follow the progress in the NRC case with respect to Assam and see what is the government's position and how long it has taken for them to address this particular issue. I'll give you only one example. So there are three judgments of the Supreme Court. One in 2005, one in 2006, and one in 2012. Uh, rather, sorry, 17th of December 2014. Okay. 2005 judgment was called Sarvananda Sonowal versus Union of India. 2006 judgment was also called Sarvananda Sonowal versus Union of India. 2014 judgment came in a writ petition of 2012 called Assam Sanmilada Mahasangha versus Union of India. Just take a look at the judgment. It's publicly available. In the first judgment in 2005, the court struck down the IMDT Act of 1983, which was a legislation that was introduced with respect to Assam after the Assam students' agitation between 1979 and 1985, when the Assam Accord was entered into 1985. What was the fundamental uh, grievance of the students of Assam? Our indigenous identity is being eviscerated. Why is it that you're applying a different cutoff date for illegal migrants for Assam when it is different for the rest of the country? Why are you not doing enough for deportation? And most importantly, the act which was introduced, the Illegal Migration Deportation, or sorry, Detection Tribunal Act of 1983, I think that's what the expansion stands for, you know what it did under the Foreigners Act?
the person who is accused of being an illegal migrant has to prove that he is not an illegal migrant. In the IMDT Act of 1983, which was introduced to facilitate and speed up the process of uh, sorry, uh, deportation and expulsion, the burden of proof was reversed. The person who accuses has to prove that the other person is an illegal migrant, otherwise he is a citizen. The legislation that was meant to speed up the process of deportation reversed the rules of burden. It took the Supreme Court to strike it down in 2005 after representations from 1979 to 1985 to 90 to 91, 93, 97. Every year the Assam Students Union would meet the government and say, please repeal, yes we will repeal, please repeal, yes we will repeal, no repeal, you go to court. Finally they had to go to court. In 2005 that was struck down. Because the court said, the numbers are given there. What, uh, what are the numbers here when it comes to ex explosion of the population here? What are they eating? There must be some children that they are eating that they are exploding like this. Okay? In terms of population, I don't know what is that. Or something else is happening. The government recognizes the push factor and the pull factor. Rather, the Supreme Court recognizes this, which is to say, there are certain push factors from the other side and there are some pull factors here. One of the pull factors is cultivation of vote banks inside this country. The Supreme Court recognizes this. And then the Supreme Court recognizes 3 lakh cases initiated. How many people deported? Is that a three-figure number? Yes, three-figure number. In 200s and 300s and sometimes in 20s. It, it dwindles down to 20s in 2005. So the Supreme Court says, please strike it down. You already have a Foreigners Act. Why do you need a separate legislation for the state of Assam? Focus on using the Foreigners Act and initiating NRC because the last NRC was conducted in 1951. Initiate a fresh NRC and start setting up foreigners tribunals and deport these people. I can't use the word kick them out. I'm sorry, that's wrong. Deport them, okay? Then in 2006, there is a second judgment that comes out. Why? Because what they were asked not to do under the different legislation, they started doing it under a rule under the Foreigners Act. You can't do it directly. Oh, okay, that means I should do it indirectly. I'll do it. That is how we interpreted it. Again, the government had, again, the Supreme Court had to step in and say, I just told you not to do this. That doesn't mean that you can do it under a different legislation. So this happened. Then the Supreme Court says, did you man the fence? Did you ensure that the entire border is fenced? What kind of electronic measures have you put in that particular place? That status report is filed slowly. And by that time, again, these people have lost their patience. They approached the Supreme Court in 2012. In 2012, they are basically saying, look, under Section 6A, which was introduced in the Citizenship Act as special provisions relating to Assam, you seem to be given, you seem to be giving special treatment to people between 1966 to 1971. I don't understand why are you giving them that special treatment. First, you said it's 1966, which is the cutoff. Then you have gradually pushed it to the 24th of March, 1971. They challenged that particular, that particular provision. And that provision, and that challenge to the provision, continues to be before the Supreme Court from 2012. We are in 2019. Why? Because the Supreme Court had basically said this requires a larger bench, a five-judge bench. The five-judge bench is yet to be constituted over the last seven years. Okay. And... The judgment in that particular case, the interim judgment, was passed on the 17th of December 2014. I suspect this government came to power in the 16th of May 2014. Correct? Okay. The government's position there was, there is, perf there is, there is nothing wrong with that particular provision, it's perfectly legal and constitutional. You tell me I'm wrong. I will name the lawyers who appeared who represented the government, not that they did anything wrong, they are only representing the government, they are only messengers, they can't do anything wrong. But the point is, the government's position is on record. This is a judgment of Justice Rohington Fali Nariman and Justice Ranjan Gogoi when he was not the Chief Justice. There is a website called indiancanoon.org, any law student will tell you that, it's publicly available. Just search for Assam Sanmilit Mahasang, that word, on Google. And this will be among the top hits you'll get for this particular judgment. Read the last few paragraphs, where the court has given detailed instructions to the government, asking them to do the following things with respect to uh, the border, and keep filing status reports in terms of their progress. 
This was 2014. Now I would request you to try and find out, and all of this is publicly available, the affidavits that the government has filed from 17th of December 2014 with respect to the progress after the directions were given. Okay? Once you read that, then you should ask yourself, is minus se zero hua hai ya minus to minus hua hai aur abhi tak zero nahi pohuncha hai? Positive ki baat to chodi dije. I am merely saying, whatever political drama is played or whatever it is, I am not even going to get into that. I am simply saying that the issue is beyond politics. It requires serious political will and commitment and realization that even if this government believes that it has a future and it will be re-elected in the future, it cannot hope to be re-elected if there is a demographic alteration, period. <laughs> okay? As simple as that. There is, in fact, I am saying I am dangling a carrot. You have a political incentive to act, so please act. You don't care about dharma, you don't care about civilization, you don't care about identity. I'm sure you care about that blessed four-letter word. What is that? It starts with F, no, V, vote. Okay. So that four-letter word, vote, matters to you, right? And since it matters to you, protect your vote bank at least. I'm giving you a naked political incentive. Do it. Because if that is the only way to push you in that particular direction, I'm happy to push you in that particular direction because our lives, our futures, our careers, our land, our civilization is at stake. Our way of life is under serious threat. Okay, next question. Uh, good evening, uh, Mr. Deepak. Uh, congratulations for a very effective and very uh, informative lecture. Thank you. And uh, we are, I think, uh, one in telling that we learned but I have a small question, and uh, that is doubt. Okay, sir. Uh, so far as NRC for Maharashtra, Assam, and everywhere you are asking, see, in our country, the land belongs to very limited people, upper class people or some uh, people with a lot of money. A lot of nomadic tribes are there who are Indians, but they do not have any document, land, or any proof to prove that right, sir. they belong to India. Right, sir. Especially in a country like ours, where in Bihar that river which is flooded and crores and crores of people have lost their property, document. Right. Similarly in Assam, everywhere this happens. Right. So what measures the government is likely to take to ensure that those indigenous people, especially the tribes people, Correct. they are not branded as an illegal migrant? Brilliant question. All Thank you so much. I agree with you. So when the Assam Accords were entered into, two points were considered that under the IMDT Act, when expulsions happened, some genuine Indians were expelled. Okay, people of Assamese origin were expelled. This is one of the considerations and one of the concerns that they expressed to the government, that the sword that you have dangled, it seems to be cutting both ways, that people of this country are being kicked out and those who do not belong to this country are not being kicked out. So effectively, more than causing, or let's say more than addressing the problem, the legislation is exacerbating and worsening the problem. That's the position that they came out with. So to address this, specific uh, operational measures were put in place, which is to effectively say, apart from you saying who you are, assume that you do not have documents, at the very least, there must be somebody who can vouch for you. Now I'll tell you where this went. Hold on. Has somebody heard of the introducer system in, under Aadhaar? Assume that you do not have any documents, then the village officer or the panchayat head can effectively introduce you as a person who he, who he recognizes, and on that basis, Aadhaar can be granted. This is how it actually started. Because the concept of UIDAI was primarily conceived of to address this question with respect to illegal migration, except that suspicions or apprehensions were aired to say that the dispensation which introduced it, I don't think it was the BJP dispensation, it was the non-BJP dispensation. When it introduced it, there were zero controls as a consequence of which it would end up legitimizing everyone. Okay? Then they decided to add safeguards. The report of the parliamentary committee headed by Yashwan Sinha then pointed out the problems with the system and also the solutions with the particular system, particularly with respect to legitimizing and legalizing illegal migrants. Frankly speaking, it remains my belief 
that those safeguards have not been introduced even today when Aadhaar has been mainstreamed, as a consequence of which you regularly read reports of fake Aadhaars being issued all over the place or Aadhaar cards being issued to illegal migrants. Okay? And legal citizens not getting there. Correct. So one of the things Since when... There was a report hmm. when Nagaland has started an RC, Right. And people from Rajasthan who settled there, I think, 100 years before uh, in Dimapur, they are being branded as uh, foreigners. Understood. I didn't know of this, but thank you for enlightening me with the nugget of information. I'll read it up. The one thing that also, with respect to Aadhaar, that people have aired, and as a legitimate concern, I'm not digressing, is when you try and use biometric information, particularly if it happens to be a daily wage laborer, his fingerprints are usually wiped off. They don't exist. Okay? And over the years, it only worsens. Each of these problems has been highlighted. In fact, there's a YouTube video where I think a kg of tomato was recognized as a human being by the system. Okay? This also exists. And this is not an extreme example. These were live examples which were aired as concerns when these so-called technological measures were being introduced as part of the Aadhaar system. Okay? Therefore, if you ask me as to what is the safeguard, I'm going to ask the safeguards that you employ for the purposes of grant of a passport, the safeguards that you employ for the purposes of verification for a driving license, at the very least try and employ those safeguards even when you try and grant Aadhaar or for NRC. A police verification. Okay, somebody might say, but yes, you can manage even that. There is frankly no end to that because I don't think there is any foolproof system. But the one thing that you can certainly try and do is you create a deterrent for anyone who tries to screw around with the system particularly if he happens to be a member of the dispensation, a member of the government or a public servant who facilitates the grant of rights to illegal migrants or access to resources to illegal migrants. He must take the rap on his knuckle for any consequence. Then there is some kind of a deterrent. But precisely to address this, a completely parallel standalone system was recommended in the 175th Law Commission report and nobody has bothered to implement it so far. That was a report that was commissioned and published under the dispensation of Sri Atal Bihari Vajpayee not by an adversarial dispensation, but by the Vajpayee government. I don't think that report has got its due. There are so many recommendations there where they say that if assume for a moment that you're not in a position to convince the other country to take back its citizens, ensure that these people are categorized as stateless people, they are not given voting rights, and they do not have the power to purchase immovable property because land is a precious resource and they cannot have access to it specific recommendations coming from experts on this particular point of view. So at least if you start thinking on those lines, I'm sure some solution will evolve. But the fact that you're not even thinking on those lines is where the problem is. Yes, next. Sir, uh, I let the moderator decide who's supposed to ask the question. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Just, uh, it's, I think it's a very good question. Let's address it from a factual standpoint today. The largest political party in the world is in power in at least 19 states. And it is in power at the center as well. Right? Inke membership to itni badga hi na? No, no, I'm not saying that. No, no, I'm saying something else. I'm absolutely open to try, uh, to try and uh, answer questions which uh, are genuinely uh, pointing towards counterfactuals or let's say hypothetical situations. I'm not denying that at all. Okay. But when it is possible for the government to actually initiate this exercise in states where the same party is in power, what happens then is this. When you initiate an exercise and the results come out, there will be pressure from the public in other states where you're not in power to basically say, when all these states are opening themselves to an NRC exercise to expose the problems in their society, why is our government not doing it? That's when public pressure builds. 
You try and create an example by practicing what you preach in the states where you are in power. Right? That is one, let's say, straight of factual answer. Second, if it is the government's and the central government's sole power to expel foreigners, that means legally the buck starts and stops with the central government. And if the state government does not cooperate, aren't there examples of the state and the center fighting out in courts? Take them to court. And certainly tell the people of that particular state that your own state dispensation is unwilling to subject itself to this exercise and cooperate with me and this is in, to your detriment. I'm sure they know how to milk this politically. I don't need to teach them, right? I'm sure it will give them another tool or handle to paint the other party in poor light before its own people. So frankly speaking, there are political solutions and there are legal solutions. But let the government actually say, I have committed X number of resources for the initiation and the conclusion of this exercise for X number of states. I have written to these states and I have told them that I am willing to take the responsibility for it. You please cooperate with me. And the following states have effectively disagreed. Let them put it out in public domain. I'm not going on a witch hunt of any particular dispensation or government. I'm simply saying the cause is so important and so critical that excuses like these cannot fly and they cannot be tolerated, particularly because it involves the future, immediate future, not, not a future about 15 or 20 years later. So today, to address your question, uh, the BJP is in power in how many states today? 18, 19, 16? 16? After the last assembly elections? 16 at least? Initiate the process in 16 states. Uttarakhand is seeing a heavy influx of illegal migrants. Uttarakhand. Regular reports coming out from that place that something is going wrong. Why not? Why not Uttar Pradesh? The largest state in the, in the, in the country. Why not Maharashtra? So, the thing is sometimes Turk ka jawab to sir fact ho sakta and these are the facts. These cannot be excuses. I am saying these, these cannot be excuses. These are Nambi Bambi excuses according to me. Yes, please. Yeah. Uh, I have a problem to tell you. I have a solution. I have a अगर as an individual, मुझे अगर कंप्लेंट करना है, जी. तो हमारे यहाँ पे सिचुएशन ऐसी है कि हमारे एमएलए चीफ मिनिस्टर, सो एक्सेसिबिलिटी लिमिटेड है. ओके. Okay. एमपी उनका खुद का घर भी अंडर कंस्ट्रक्शन है तो पता नहीं कहाँ मिलना है. जी सर. और अगर कारपोरेटर को पूछूँगा, जी. तो बोलेगा तू ही बता दे यार. हाँ. तो ऐसे सिचुएशन में एस the public revelation is I'm hard on hearing in one ear, so kindly give him the mic. <laughs> <laughs> Sir, who's running this poor show? Is it constitution, government, or court, or is it us? What show did he say? Poor show. Poor is show. It? Poor show. Like this, ah, okay. Ah, okay. See, uh, in a democracy, I think at least the, the initiative or the responsibility for starting an action lies with the government. If the matter ultimately goes and gets stuck in the court, keep blaming the courts, at least then the government has an excuse to say, I have done my job, I have done my job, I have done my job. Let them at least do that. But if you don't initiate action, then it creates a semblance of a doubt at least, at least a modicum of doubt saying, Aapki mantra hai ya nahi? Do you have any interest in acting on this issue or not? So, in that sense, I agree with the previous gentleman who mentioned that at least they are talking about this issue and at least they are making concrete strides in this, in this particular front. Uh, I will not be a pessimist. I am a die-hard realist optimist. And to the extent that they have decided to talk about this issue is great. I am only saying that perhaps you should go beyond that and quickly start acting on it. Now coming to your question, sir. Uh, last week, was it, that the report came that uh, two Rohingyas approached the Supreme Court? The Supreme Court? Right, the Supreme Court agreed to hear the plea of two Rohingyas. 
An illegal migrant seems to have the confidence to approach a court of law to protect his rights. Why aren't individuals in the country lacking in confidence in approaching the court asking for deportation of illegal migrants? I would simply say, approach the court and impress upon the court the seriousness with which you have taken it by filing multiple petitions. And it should be across the country. Assume for a moment a hundred different petitions land in the Bombay High Court, in the Madras High Court, in the Calcutta High Court, in the Jharkhand High Court, in Dehradun and other places. Are you telling me that this will not put enough pressure on the government as well as the courts, saying that the public is taking it seriously, therefore you might as well uh, start getting your act together on this issue? Uh, having said that, let me also say that the general perception uh, may or may not be true is that some causes are more important and some causes are not that important when you go to court. Okay, that is also an, an impression. Maybe there is an element of truth to it. I don't know beyond that if I can say. But at the very least, you can tell the government that I am forced to go to court because you have chosen not to do anything about it and you have pushed me to the wall and therefore I am going to court. At the very least, that is the message that approaching the court of an individual conveys to the establishment that I have had to knock the doors of the court because you have done nothing about this particular issue and all you have been doing about it is talking or even not even talking. So if there is, let's say, a proceeding that can be initiated under the Foreigners Act, uh, either by the government or the establishment or let's say the police authorities and they fail to do so, I. I categorically put my money where my mouth is to say that an individual has the right to approach the court in a writ petition asking for deportation. Try filing the particular petition. If it doesn't work, then we'll see. But this is something that you can certainly do. Because it's surprising that the other side has the confidence to approach the court for everything. And we don't seem to be doing that enough. Therefore, my central message has been, kindly do not assume that one particular organ of the state is the fiefdom of any particular ideology. It is the Supreme Court of India. Therefore, everybody has the right to approach the court for justice. The unfortunate part is, most of these petitions, when they are filed in courts, are filed without research. They have a lot of political arguments as opposed to legal arguments. They are poorly represented. As a consequence of which, an individual's failure affects the cause. Eight, that, that could be equally with respect to denial of minority status for Hindus in certain states, despite the fact that they are a numerical minority. That's the answer. Yes, somebody else had a question. Yes, sir. I have one question to you. And, uh, uh, during the last five, six years, this government has been speaking about the two sentences, Sabka Saat, Sabka Vikas, added okay. to it, Sabka Vishwas. Now, what this has, uh, do you think that this, uh, th the number of rights that has come down during this period in this government, this has given more safety, security and flourish to that particular community or will lead to a mis bigger unrest that is going to come in the near future? Uh, let me try an exit option from this question. Is it connected to the topic? Yes, sir. How? Because what I feel, is if a spiritual community is feeling more safe... I'm not running away from the question. Explain the relevance and then yeah. I'll answer. Yes. Uh, because once, uh, if you're asking about the Indian identity... Yes. So Indian identity, does it only mean that we are talking about Hindus? Okay. But when it comes to other religions that are in this, in this country... And, they right. are, and if you are afraid of one particular community in particular... Right. So if they are feeling safe because the number of rights have come down... Right. They are feeling more safe, they are feeling more secure, now they are flourishing more. Sir, but I am told that they are all scared. This is what you have is, <laughs> is it not? No, so my concern is a bit different. At least that's what I am seeing on social media newspapers, they are all scared. They, that is what is Sir, they are terribly scared. Whatever yeah. they do is only out of fear. Fear is making them do things that they would have otherwise never done. I am sorry, I stand up for the community, you are wrong, sir. Thank you. They are 100%, frankly speaking, I think, um, and, and I'm going to put my faith in credible, reliable mainstream media, because I'm sure that they are paragons of truth and virtue. 
and I'm absolutely sure that they mean every word that they say, they verify every report before they publish. I'm 100% sure that they've actually gone to the field before they publish whatever they've published. And going by what they say, they're all scared. So something needs to be done more. This is not enough. I don't think we're doing enough to actually address concerns of this Darahua. Uh, can I say it? No, I shouldn't be saying it. So you can't say it. So my point is, uh, over the last two weeks, if you think that riots have come down, sorry, sir, a Durga temple was destroyed in the capital of the country. OK? I don't agree. Frankly speaking, anti-social elements and elements who have a vested interest in, in, in fermenting and spewing communal violence have gained more traction, especially after the 23rd of May 2019, as a consequence of which there, are, there have been a spate of incidents. I am not going to hold any particular community responsible. I'm simply saying that as long as India continues to be a soft state where there is no repercussion or deterrent for any kind of crime, anybody will get away with anything. <laughs> Nobody has the fear that a certain act will translate to a certain legal consequence and it will come back to bite him. And I don't think any dispensation has changed that impression of India that it remains a soft state and it responds to stone pelting and stone pelting alone. And that impression needs to be changed. If you cannot change that impression with 3 not 3 and you couldn't change that impression with what was it? Uh, 282, what are you going to change it with? With 543? Then effectively it's only an excuse. Or though or karunga, or though or karunga. This is an Akshay Patra. It can take more votes but cannot deliver. I don't think that's the way it's supposed to operate. Will Somewhere I think you have to draw the line between mollycoddling, rabid, rapacious, savage, barbaric sentiments and pushing it under the basket of victimhood. And using that as a means to gag any kind of inquiry into the facts of a certain issue. What exactly happened? How is it that in one lane and in only one lane where Hindus live and there is a temple, that temple is destroyed, it's vandalized. Idols and broken idols are urinated upon. And there are videos of it. They're scared, sir, they're scared. Yes. We'll be taking one last question yes. because our speaker leaves tonight itself. So please just stick with the time constraint and just go ahead with one question. Yes. G. G. I take it it's a rhetorical question. I don't know. I don't think I have either the wisdom to predict anything. Someone who... No, sir, it's a very Because... At least then you could openly stand up for your rights. And people who would have stood up for your rights would be open about it. Today, everybody wants to polish and burnish his politically correct secular credential and walk around. As a consequence of which, the truly orphan community in this country is, I leave it at that. <laughs> The common citizens were protesting against a, uh, you know, a huge volume of uh, Ill migrants coming from the Middle correct, East. Correct. And the basic argument of those people in South Korea and Japan was that, you know, they are not Japanese or South Korean, and we want to protect our values. Whereas they do take in people from Thailand and so on. Correct. So, do you think the whole confusion around illegal immigration and should we let th let them in or not is basically a question of identity as of you said it is. because the indian identity is itself a matter of debate between Correct. the political left and the political right so Correct. called so 
do you think first it is important to define an Indian identity? Which is why I said that the first priority should be to get your civilizational identity in order. If you lack the civilizational confidence to take a position as to who you are and where you come from, you create a situation of confusion and that situation of confusion facilitates a lot of mischievous actors. And that opens the doors for a lot of anti-Indic elements to enter this part of the country or this country. It is really surprising that s smaller nations and younger nations have much more civilizational confidence than the Indian nation. A Poland has the guts to openly stand up to the BBC and the rest of the Western media to say, we will do what is in the best interests of our people, period. We do not care for the opinions of BBC. That is the clear statement that the Polish foreign minister comes out with. I am not sure how many of us, forget politicians, how many of us in our circles have the guts, the confidence, the presence of mind, the gumption and let's call it the, I don't know, I don't wish to use the word, to basically take the position in our, in our office spaces, in college spaces. The moment you see yourself outnumbered by a certain point of view because there is peer pressure and because that's a political, act, uh, politically correct opinion, you either keep your mouth shut or you change your opinion or you say, no, 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 I have got nothing to do with politics. Why should I get into this issue at all? If that is the spineless, gutless position that you as a private citizen take in your private circles, you're bound to produce people who represent you like that. Because you are throwing up that options as a society. They have not come from anywhere else. I am sure that God did not send them. In which case I have to perhaps become agnostic or atheistic. But the point is, these are the kind of options that you have thrown up from your midst and you have given them the right to write your destinies. And they don't seem to have the confidence to openly say, what are you telling me that after 2000 years and at least from 700 AD after going through such nonsense, I still don't have the right, the freedom and the liberty to say who I am and who this country belongs to and what is its civilizational identity. I've still not used the word religion. I'm saying civilizational identity because it is all encompassing. Thank you.